Hey there, welcome to the Off by One security stream. How is everyone doing? I, I guess everyone's preparing to go over to Vegas for Black Hat and DEF CON, I imagine. This is probably, well, except for the COVID year, one of the only years out of like the last 20 years that I won't be at DEF CON, which makes me a little bit sad, but I actually have to go to LA to record some vocals for the band I'm currently in. So, you know, takes priority over the other, but I will definitely miss out on some cool stuff and I'm a little bit sad about not being there. That being said, I threw this stream together at the last minute because I realized I probably won't do one next Friday since I, I imagine no one will be around to uh, to watch the stream, but um, we'll see. Maybe I'll come up with something. I've been talking to some folks as well about uh, possible streams. I, one example, and I'm hoping it'll come to fruition so I don't want to jinx it, but the folks from BC Security uh, are going to come on, I hope, September 1st, so it's a few weeks away, to show us some cool stuff they've been working on with PowerShell Empire and the latest and greatest going on over there. There uh, might even be some giveaways for that. I'm not sure yet. I have a giveaway that I want to do on an upcoming stream. It'll be for Hackfest in Hollywood. So you will need to get yourself to Hollywood, but I'll get you a free pair of tickets uh, if you can make it there in person. That is, I think it's like, 300 to 400 dollars is the price for that but so far and you probably heard me talking about it as well we've got um let me do a quick check actually can you all hear me okay is everything working good i don't have my marketing guy randall on here to assist me with that to let me know so and i'm using my headset as well so if someone could just post up uh if you can hear me that'd be that'd be great i know there's not too many people on because this was very last minute but it would be great to hear if you can see and hear everything okay. Yes, okay, thank you, sir, appreciate that. Um, yeah, so back to Hackfest. I'm super excited about this one because we're doing it in Hollywood, California this year, and every year prior, it's been in Washington, D.C. area, which is great for some things, but not for other things. So we wanted to mix it up. This year, it's in Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel at, uh, great, at downtown Hollywood, and it's right on the Walk of Fame or shame, whatever you want to call it. And it's a fantastic hotel. It's like where they hosted the original Emmys and stuff like that. But I've we've already got, so we had a ton of CFP submissions for this one, more than we've ever gotten before, which got me excited. I think there was at least 60 or 70 submissions, which is pretty decent for a CFP for a conference that we've never done before in that area. And a lot of really great talks. And we've already confirmed uh, Valentina, who is chompy, for the day one keynote, we've got Lena Lau, who is in Versecos on Twitter for day two keynote. We've got Connor McGar coming out to talk about some cool Windows kernel stuff. We've got Ruben Boonen, who is also at uh, IBM X4, is working with Chompy and stuff to do some neat presentation as well. So we've got those all slotted in already. We have a bunch of like IoT hacking thing going on, uh, lock picking. Uh, virtual reality stuff. We've got some blockchain stuff going on at the same time. There's a curriculum capture to flag running with the prize, such as a free sans course. Uh, we've got like the, the penthouse room on the top of the Roosevelt, which is like an outside deck area overlooking Hollywood for one of the evenings for us all to hang out. Um, it's going to be an amazing event. And I, I, I haven't been this excited about this event. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be good. Anyway, if you can make it out to that, that is November 16th and 17th in November, 16th, 17th in LA. So I will post more on that. I will announce soon a, a stream that I'll do where I'll give away a couple of tickets if you're able to make it. So what is today's stream about? This is going to be about return-oriented shellcode. Um, I started off this stream 11 months ago, back in September 2022. And the very first stream I did, I announced, I said, hey, would anyone be interested in retired content from one of the courses that I've authored? Retired doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's a little bit older material. So like the very first stream I did was a use after free exploit against Internet Explorer. And it was a fun one to do because even though that specific version of the browser is no longer supported, the technique to exploit a use after free vulnerability is still the same. So it's still valuable. It's just a target isn't as valuable, but the technique is. So I also did a, a follow-up to that one recently where I, I showed a use after free against IE11 that was a information disclosure bug, which got us around ASLR. So we looked at how you can leak things out and control what gets leaked out. So the reason I bring that up is because this, this 
material today is also from a retired section from one of my courses. And same as same as I just said, this technique is still viable, still useful. It's just the target is no longer viable. So that's why I want to show this. And if you're interested in it, awesome. It'll be recorded and up on YouTube as well. I'm going to show a slide first here in a moment to show you what we need to do. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and put that up now. Give me a moment. Uh, present. Let me switch it here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Now it's just me. Hello. That's uh, too close. And then I'm going to share just the slide deck here if I can find it. Hold on one second. I got to pull myself off here to make this work. So give me one moment. We'll cancel this and I'll be back in one second. Okay, you should be able to see this now. Let me increase the size of this. Let's see if I can go full screen on it. So let's do a shift F5. Is that going to work? Cool. Awesome. This will be helpful. So this diagram was actually a pain to put together when I originally put this thing together. These diagrams are just like taking something that's complex and making it visual is not always the easiest thing to do. So this is what I'm going to be walking through. And we're going to go back to this a bunch of times because it's impossible to remember everything that's on there. But this is basically showing you the order in which you need to put things when you're using this technique. Now, the first thing we need to do is get our vehicle to be able to use this technique, that just being a, a control of the process. So it's going to be a basic buffer overflow because that's not the point. We just need a vehicle to be able to use this technique. So the first thing we need to do is figure out where the vulnerability is. That'll be really quick. And then once we find out where the vulnerability is, you can see where it says gadget one, like right, uh, I don't know, right here where I'm shaking the little mouse cursor, the gadget number one, that's going to be the return pointer overwrite. And we want to overwrite that with the address of the very first gadget that we want to use. And if you're unfamiliar with the term gadget, a gadget is a silly name for a sequence of instructions that are useful to you and it's aiding you in your attack. So what, what we normally use return oriented programming for is if you're on a Windows system, for example, we use it to set up the arguments to make a system call something like virtual protect or virtual alloc or heap create or write process memory anything that will allow us to change permissions in memory where our shell code relies so that we can now execute code on the stack or the heap which we shouldn't be able to do normally so that's what we typically use rop for this is going to be different in where let's say that you are exploiting a target process running on a machine and this particular vulnerability doesn't allow for the space or any other way in which you can get your shell code into the target. So let's say again, you are exploiting a target process running on a system and for whatever reason, you can't get your payload in there. It's, it certainly happens. So the question would be, is it possible to then string together code sequences or gadgets that mimic or emulate what the shell code would have done. So for example, the very first thing we need to do in a shell code is zero out the accumulator register. Then we need to search through executable memory, so the code segment, to find an XOR, the accumulator register instruction, followed by a return, preferably. So this is return-oriented shell code. We could do jump-oriented or other techniques in the whole oriented programming technique space. But uh, for this one, we're keeping it simple. This is just like our first time, at least on this stream, looking at how you would approach return oriented shell code. So we're going to rely on code sequences that mimic a portion of what our shell code would have done had we been able to get it into the target process. So again, for whatever reason, we're pretending that there's no way we can get our payload onto this system in, in the process. So therefore, we want to string together short sequences of code that mimic our what our shell code would do. 
Now, yeah, we might be able to find a one gadget or something like that, but that's that's not the technique we're looking at today. This technique is ROP shellcode. I've definitely had to use this technique multiple times on various Linux executables. Um, I can't name the specific vendor because that would be a violation of the agreement, but this one particular vendor had a product that, and being careful in my words, had a product that stated and claimed that they are able to add additional entropy with ASLR at the at the code level, like at the function and, and even block level. So think about that. ASLR normally is randomization of the stack of the heap of the libraries and other segments in memory, making it difficult for an attacker to know where something is. So the randomization typically is limited by Obviously, if it's 32-bit or 64-bit, we've got more entropy in 64-bit. But also, we need to maintain segmentation. So we can't randomize the most significant bits. We also have to worry about boundary and alignment. So we typically don't randomize the lowest nibble or byte. So the more bits that we're reducing uh, decreases, of course, the randomization or the entropy. So that's that's all fine and good for stack and heap and all that, like, like we're talking about. There, there's also in Linux another thing called PI, right? Position Independent Executable. It's, uh, you've probably heard of that protection before. So just because we've got the flag on for ASLR and proc, sys, kernel, randomized VA space, great. We've got that on. That's randomizing the stack and the heap and the libraries. But what about the the binary itself, the code segment of the binary that's not going to be randomized based on that flag. You have to compile it as a position independent executable, a pie. Okay, so this example vendor that I'm referring to, think about, again, being careful with my words, think about code that needs to run and control special environments. And by that, I, I mean, think about shipping, like to ports. We're talking about supply chain, like physical supply, like shipping, shipments of these container ships coming into port, the code that's running on those things, or airplanes, or trains, or military equipment. You see where I'm going with this? I'm talking about those types of applications and processes that most of us never get access to. A lot of it's industrial control type environments as well. So... In a lot of cases, again, being careful with my words, in a lot of cases, they will statically compile that code. And they'll bring, by statically compiling it, they're bringing the library code and stuff with it. Everything's compiled in. So what this particular vendor promises is randomization at the block level even. So there's a shim that gets compiled in a compile time and randomizes the, every time you start the process, it re-randomizes all the blocks. So even if the idea is even if you were to find a memory leak, that it won't work because normally in an information disclosure bug, like a memory leak, we would leak something out that's at a static relative offset from the base address of whatever module it's coming from. Like in the example I showed in the browser recently, it was, it was a, a virtual function table. So anytime we got that virtual function table to leak, we knew that we could always subtract the relative virtual address offset to recover the base address of that DLL. What this particular vendor is saying is, well, now you can't do that because we're randomizing the code every time you run the process. And therefore, if you can get something to leak, what's getting leaked out is not going to be the same each time. So it sounds like a pretty interesting idea and, and tool. The problem with it is, you couldn't randomize the libraries. So all these dependencies that are these shared objects that are getting compiled in, you couldn't randomize those unless you were to actually go and recompile those libraries with this special shim. And, and that would actually introduce additional problems because it's, it's fine for the function itself, I'm sorry, not the function, but the program itself, the main binary executable itself, to, to do this randomization at the function and block level. But when you get into randomization of custom compiled libraries and, and things 
are expected to be at certain places. It, it just breaks. So why am I saying all this? Because in that environment, in a particular engagement, I was able to use this technique that we're talking about here, return-oriented shellcode, because everything was like on that target system, and there's no way for you to get shellcode on it. So it was like a special. Another example of when I've seen people use this technique, voting systems, voting machine hacking. Was, you were, there's no way for you to have gotten your payload on there. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be recorded. I record all these. They go up on YouTube afterward. All right, so hopefully that explains why we should care about this. Now I'm going to do a 32-bit example just to keep things easier um, as far as like the addressing and such. Now there's a couple of issues here. I, I don't, the stream, I don't want these streams to take eight hours. So I try to like focus on one particular thing at a time. And even then it goes into an hour to two hours sometimes. So I'm reducing the noise or the things that might get in our way. Like for example, ASLR is on, but I'm actually statically mapping a couple of things, which is not far from reality. Oftentimes, notoriously on Windows, applications come with their own DLLs. And if you run a tool like Mona or on Linux CheckSec or something, and you look at the 20 DLLs that this particular binary needs, not all of them are always randomized. Um, that's what's gotten a lot of applications into trouble many times. An infamous one was the Java Runtime Environment 6. MSVCR71.dll. I'll always remember that DLL because that was the DLL that allowed us to disable DEP basically effectively by changing permissions. And it wasn't randomized, so you avoided ASLR. And that thing lived on for years. It was a beautiful DLL for exploitation purposes. So anyway, let's get back to the point here. First thing we need to do is find a vulnerability, which is a stupid buffer overflow that we're going to use to then use this technique. Now, here's the interesting part. We need to find the gadgets, which again are short sequences of code to, to complete a part of my overall objective of popping a shell, a privileged shell. And the very first thing we need to have happen is we need to zero out the accumulator register. Why do we need to do that? You will see in a moment why we need to zero out the accumulator register. Just know for now, that's the first thing we're doing. So that would be where it says gadget number one. And you can see it says that overwrite the, we overwrite the return pointer with gadget number one. Gadget number one needs to point to an address in memory that's executable and holds XOR EAX EAX followed by a return. The stack pointer would advance now to gadget number two. And we need to do something else. What do we need to do? Gadget number two, we need to do a pop pop ret. I know those of you who have exploited Windows SEH chain issues, uh, pop pop ret is a technique we or a gadget that we use for that, but this is not that. We need to do a pop pop ret. Okay, what are we popping into ECX? The first thing we're popping into ECX is going to be 0B, 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 0B. Now, the reason that we need zero b's there is because zero b is the system call number for exec ve on linux so the linux syscall tables are static 32 and 64 bit and we need to get zero b into the accumulator register at some point because when you invoke a system call an an int 80 system call on linux it expects the system call number to be in the accumulator register so just know for now that we're popping 0B, 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 0B into ECX register. We don't need the first three bytes of those 0Bs, but we can't put zeros in there because that's a null terminator. So we could put anything for the first three bytes as long as it doesn't cause an issue. The only one I really care about is the lowest byte. And you'll see we're going to do an OR here in a moment with AL to get that 0B into the accumulator register. But before we do that, we're popping off the stack into edx null minus 24. this is a weird one to explain verbally um, you'll see what it why it's needed more as we go through this but look over to the far right see where it says null right there we need a 
double word of zeros to reside at that offset on the stack. The reason we need that is because we need to make the environmental pointer, ENVP, the address point to a, a D word of nulls to satisfy just a requirement on a Linux box um, when we're doing a system call. So each system call, if you look at the syscall table, they all have their own set of argument requirements. So AX gets the syscall number, but then there's BX and CX and DX and SI and DI. Like it's different on 32 and 64 bit as well, but you, it's static. So all you got to do is go look at the syscall table and figure out what arguments need to be in which registers. But for right now, we need to make it so the environmental pointer points to a D word of, of nulls. So then what is the null minus 24? That's the weird part. Why minus 24? Well, it ends up being, if you look at gadget number three, where I'm waving the mouse cursor, it says move the D word of nulls, this is at and syntax. It says move the double word of nulls from EAX, because we XORed it, into whatever EDX is pointing to plus one eight. So this ends up being the only gadget, as you'll see soon, that we're able to find that writes whatever is in the EAX register to a destination. It's the only gadget we'll be able to find that does this. I mean, we don't have the luxury all the time of having the perfect gadget always readily available. So we've got to make do with what we have. For this particular target process we're going to exploit, that's the only gadget that was available that writes what's in the accumulator register to an offset to EDX. So it happens to be offset 24 or hex 18. So that's why null minus 24 is the address that we need to pop into EDX because the gadget is going to write to EDX plus 24. If that doesn't make sense, you'll see it as we go through this exploit. We just need to write the double word of nulls over to this offset on the right. So next up, the gadget number uh, three writes that D word of nulls to EDX plus 24. Gadget number four does an or ALCL. That's going to take the zero B in CL and put it into AL. So now the accumulator register will have 0000000B, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is 11 syscall number for exec VE. The next thing we're doing is pop EBX ret. What are we popping into EBX? The address of our argument. What argument? Well, in this particular exploit, we're going to invoke the exec VE system call. We need to pass it a pointer or a string or pointer to a string that we want it to execute. So you'll see what I'm going to do here in a moment. I'm going to give it the name of some silly little program that will pop us a, a system shell, a root shell. So we'll get back to that. Just know right now that we need to pop into EBX the address of our argument, which is the string that we want to pass to exec VE. The next gadget is pop pop red again. So we're popping into ECX the pointer to argv. That's the argument vector. So it needs to be a pointer to a pointer. In other words, it needs to be a pointer to the pointer to the string that we want to have executed. That's to satisfy argv. So one more time. We need ECX to hold a pointer to a pointer that resides on the stack that points to our string that we want to have executed. And then we're popping into EDX a pointer to the environmental pointer, which is simply that pointer to null. So we need EDX, before we invoke the system call, to point to the D word of null bytes. Then we return to our final gadget, which is an interrupt 80. That's the old style of doing a, invoking a system call, which still works today. So when we do an int 80, it's going to check the accumulator register for the system call number, which is going to find 11, exec VE. As long as we satisfy all the requirements, this is going to work. The last thing we're going to have here is after the D word of nulls, we're going to basically literally write in ASCII hex the string argument that we want exec VE to execute and terminate that with a null byte at the very end. That is our attack layout. So it's kind of a bit ugly. If you've never done it before, it may look a little complex, but it's really not when you break it down. Remember what we're doing. We are emulating what our shell code would have done had we been able to just use MSF Venom and 
do a command exec shell code and get it onto the system. But we don't have that luxury in this example. So we're going to have to map back to this diagram a couple of times here and there. Give me a moment. Now I'm going to switch over to the command shell. So give me one moment here. I'm going to pull that out. We are going to share screen again. And this time we're going to look at, no, not a Chrome tab, VMware. All right, now we are back. We should be in a shell, and we are. Cool. So I've got three shells open up, and they're ready to go. I'm going to need three because one of them is going to be my script window, so we can create our script. One of them is going to be our debugging window, and the other one's going to be our um, window to like hunt for gadgets and stuff like that. So we need three windows. First thing I want to do is actually run the vulnerable program so we can see where the problem is. It's called sec760rop. And if we check it, you can see it's uh, set UID bit is set and we're running as root. And that's, of course, something we'd want to exploit because if we can find a vulnerability and exploit it, it runs it at the context of the owner, which is root in this case. Great. So we have to find out where the vulnerability is. When we run this program, it simply says usage. Give it a file name. Okay, so let's create a file. We'll say touch. I'll call it input. And let's say echo. Actually, I'll just say Python minus C print A times 20. And we'll put that into our input file. And now if we run ROP shellcode or sec760 ROP, with input as an argument, it simply dumps out the file contents. Uh, question says, is this technique the same or similar to using ROP to bypass DEP? If it's different, what's the difference? Yeah, I went over that a bit earlier. I don't know if you maybe joined a little late, but um, when we're doing, when we're using ROP to change permissions in memory, like to get around DEP, we are setting up the system call to something like virtual protect or virtual alloc or memprotect, whatever operating system we're on, and we're just passing the arguments so that the address where our shellcode resides will have its permissions changed to read, write, execute. This is different in that we, and, and typically we would do that, change permissions where our shellcode resides because we're able to get our shellcode on the target process. In this example, we're pretending that we can't do that. What if it's the case where we can't get our payload into the memory of the target process and have it executed. Or maybe we can't turn off debt. Maybe it's just not possible. Maybe there's just not the right gadgets for it or something. What we're doing instead is compiling our shell code on the fly, basically. We're, we're simply re using return-oriented programming to string together a bunch of code sequences to mimic what our shell code would do to pop a shell. So it's a big difference there. I, hopefully that answers the question. So we've got this thing. Obviously, there's going to be a vulnerability in this uh, opening of the file content. So if we do a simple obj dump minus r against the program, if you look through this, stir copy sticks out, right, as, a, as an obvious issue. So that's probably where the vulnerability is. I don't have Jeff or PETA or Pwn tools or anything on this box. I didn't have time to put it on there. Um, so we'll just use regular old, you know, grep and stuff. And um, we're going to go in and check out when stir copy is called in this program. So let's go ahead and say GDB sec 760 ROP. We'll do an info functions. Now we do info functions. Obviously, anything with a PLT on the end is a dynamically compiled uh, function because that's our dynamic dependencies. The procedure linkage table and the global offset table is similar to like the import address table on Windows, right? Where if we dynamically compile this and don't statically compile it, we've got to link this stuff at runtime. So anything with PLT is linked at runtime. When we continue down, though, you can see a bunch of internal functions like static stack, main, map the libc, move, overflow, usage r. So there's a bunch of stuff in there that's internal. 
And you can't, you can strip internal functions, but you can't strip dynamic dependencies. Because how else would the process be able to let the dynamic linker know what it needs to link and what the dependencies are? Okay, so let's disassemble the main function first here. So disassemble main. And in here we see a call to usage, a call to f open. We keep going down, printf. Keep going down, we see a call to f get, f close. At the very bottom, we see calls to map the libc, static stack, and move. So let's check out move. Another thing we could do, we could set a breakpoint on the call to stir copy inside the procedure linkage table. Since it's dynamically linked, it always has to go through the PLT to do that call. So if you set a breakpoint on the PLT address, you'll always break. But um, this is not a complex program. So let's just look at the move function. Inside here, you can see there's a call to overflow. So I intentionally named these functions so that they're meaningful. Obviously, in the real world, I would strip this stuff out. So call overflow. So let's disassemble overflow. In here, there's our call to stir copy. So the easy way to find out the buffer size is to simply look at the argument being passed to stir copy for the destination, which is directly above it. Here we're saying load the effective address negative four zero from the base pointer into EAX. So this is AT&T syntax. So we're source followed by destination operands. So we're loading the effective address that is negative four zero hex from the base pointer into EAX, and then we're writing it to the top of the stack, and that becomes the argument for the destination for stir copy. So that's our buffer size, hex four zero. So we could say print zero x four zero, and you can see it's 64 bytes. We could have done that in our head, of course. So 64 bytes is the buffer size. This program has no canaries. You can see it has no canaries because we don't see a call to stack check fail. Like I said, I want to focus on just the technique here, which is return oriented shell code. If there were canaries, we'd have another problem in our way. So we know the buffer size. What sits between the buffer and the return pointer? If it's 32 bit, the frame pointer is always going to be there. So we got to do another four bytes for the frame pointer. So it's going to be 68 bytes before we get to that return pointer. So let's verify that. We're going to drop to our shell. And I'm going to say Python minus C print A times 68, which should get us to the return pointer. Plus, I'll just put BBBB -B 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 to overwrite the return pointer. That will be 4242424242. Um, and we'll send that into input. So I'll drop back into my debugger. So if we say run input, you could see we figured that out pretty quickly. Again, the buffer overflow part was just to get us to the point where we can actually start doing this technique that is the return oriented shellcode technique. But real easily, we found the buffer size. Um, how realistic is it nowadays to get an exploit working against browsers, Apple, Microsoft, Android? I never hear much anymore with your input. Um, yes, yeah, so I talk about that stuff a lot in these streams. The uh, the example that I walked through a few weeks ago, which was the, another browser exploitation example, that was an example of a two-chained exploit. So in order to get code execution, you need to have both a memory leak to bypass ASLR because all DLLs are compiled with rebasing, dynamic base, and then you need a code execution bug. So you need the two together. The code execution bug was a type confusion bug. So it was a use after free vulnerability and a type confusion vulnerability that worked together to get full code execution on the target. So that kind of stuff still is realistic. Now, the, the thing that was interesting about that vulnerability that I showed in that session was that memgc and deferred free and isolated heaps on browsers are a big pain. So the cool thing about that one was we avoided memgc by working with a use after free vulnerability involving a string, involving um, text. And text is not something that is was protected by memgc and isolated heap because what those mitigations protect are 
HTML objects like div, span, title, button. It doesn't protect JavaScript string allocations and text allocations. So if you can find a, if you're able to find a vulnerability that affected that, you could get, you could avoid that stuff. Now this stuff obviously like these mitigations come out and those their job is to make it really hard to get this stuff working. And in Exploit Guard alone on Windows, there's over 20 mitigations. None of them are turned on by default, but there are some really good mitigations that are on by default that you can't do anything about anymore. The virtualization-based security on the Windows kernel and HVCI and such, I have Connor McGar on a few months ago talking about that. It uh, makes life very difficult. The, the day of Windows kernel code execution is far and few between. That's why everything switched over to data attacks, your, your write primitive attacks, not worrying about code execution. Like with token stealing, the way we used to do token stealing back in the day, a few years ago, was by executing your shell code that would steal the token of PID4, which is system. But now you can't typically do that, so you have to use data only attacks. So working with uh, write primitives, but we're not, going to go down that rabbit hole right now. If you check out the prior streams, you'll see we, we hit on all this stuff. But yes, it's definitely harder nowadays, but you see exploits still coming out all the time. Um, look at Apple. There's some other critical vulnerabilities that were patched just the other day. And, and there were remote code execution exploits in the wild, which is wild. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's get moving or we'll never get finished. So we've got control of the instruction pointer now. That is our vehicle to begin ROP shellcode. Now, what do we need to do? We need to find the gadgets. That's the first thing I want to do is find those gadgets that we saw on the slide. And the first one was XOR EAX EAX followed by a return, right? Okay, so what do we need to do this? We need, we need to know the memory address of a module, a shared object, that's not being randomized, or we need an information disclosure vulnerability. I could easily have rigged this up to where you need to utilize the fact that something like um, uh, a, sorry, I'm thinking of the exact function I wanna use. It could be something, I've dropped to a shell real quick. Let me see something real quick. So let's do obj dump minus r. So it could be something like a printf or a get string function. There, there's different functions here that since it's dynamically based and they're utilized, we can use the fact that they're inside the procedure linkage table to print out things from memory. And then you can use cool little tools that allow you to go compare all the different versions of libc to find out what offset is there. I, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole either, but we can easily make this more complicated and have to deal with a memory disclosure problem. I, I just don't want to do all that at the same time. Our focus for this one is ROP shellcode. So in this example, I've mimicked the fact that oftentimes not everything is randomized. Oftentimes things get statically mapped into memory, which is a big no-no, but it happens. I remember back in the day, Linux kernel 2.6.17 through 2.6.19, which I just saw recently on an IoT engagement, um, has a default ASLR bypass that you can do nothing about. And that's an old kernel version, but even though randomization was on, there was an ASLR bypass that was globally available. It was the fact that the Linux gate, which is a virtually dynamically linked shared object, a VDSO used for fast system calls, at memory address FFFF E777 was a jump ESP. Global bypass. It was like, um, and then they got rid of it, of course, once people called it out. But like, things aren't always randomized, especially if the, if the binary is not a pi. A pi, again, is a position-independent executable. Or if rel row is not on, which is relocation read-only, which makes the got, the GOT, read-only. So we are mapping something. That's why there's a function called map the libc. I think we saw it earlier. So I'm going to use ltrace here. So let's drop to a shell. And we're going to use ltrace. And we're going to say a couple things. So let's redirect standard error first off two greater than ampersand one. And then we're going to run the program. 
sec 760 ROP input, and then we're going to grep for nmap because that's what's going to map the memory. Let's do that minus e nmap or minus e read, and then we're going to say minus b2. So that's going to give us the couple lines prior. So let's see what we get. All right, right there, we get nmap. So here we got open. It's opening a, a library called libply.1337, interesting numbers, .so.2.0.0. So that's a shared object. So libply is a real shared object. This is one that's libply.lit. So I'm intentionally mapping this thing into the process. And then you can see it's being nmapped to this address. That's important. It's being statically mapped to that address, even though ASLR is on. It's also the case that the stack is being statically mapped. Remember, we're not dealing with ASLR bypass in this example. We're just looking at the ROP shellcode technique. If ASLR was on, as I said before, you would need to use the appropriate function to be able to get around that, which is not hard typically in these types of vulnerabilities. I'll do a session on that in the future if you want to see it. But um, we see that the, the library is being statically mapped. This becomes important because now we need to use a ROP gadget finder to hunt through that module to look for gadgets. So let's do that. First thing we need to do is remember something that I often would see students forget inside class. So I'll preempt it and mention it now. That is, since MMAP is mapping that library, you don't want to go looking for the gadget and validating that it does exist inside the debugger until after that module has been loaded. It sounds silly, but people make that mistake all the time and it's a waste of time. So we need to find out where the MMAP call is to load that module and make sure we set a breakpoint after that point in time. And then we'll need to remember that any address that the ROP gadget tool gives us, we'll have to add it to this base address that MMAP is placing, uh, where it's placing it at. So let me think here. We've got that address. I'm going to leave that there for now. Actually, I'm going to copy that address. And what we're going to do now is drop back into the debugger and we'll say disassemble main again because I forgot the function name. Move. So disassemble move. We've got a call to overflow. Disassemble overflow. And we've got stir copy. So I missed something else. We go back to main at the very bottom here. There's map the libc. So we need to set a breakpoint after that thing happens so that we can do the validation. So I'll just set a breakpoint here on the call to static stack because at that point in time, I'll know that the module has been loaded. So let's grab that. We'll set a breakpoint break. Normally, I would never do this without a helper tool in GDB, an extension, but I don't have one. And I will say run input. Okay, so we hit the breakpoint. We are at the moment in time when there's another call happening. So we know that that module is now loaded. So that address that we used before, if I say examine eight instructions, you can see it's loaded now. Uh, that didn't work. That was the wrong thing. So let's go and grab that address then. I'm going to drop back down to a shell real quick. We'll run that command again. This, 30A. So it's 30A0000. 30A0000. You can see there's something there now. Nothing interesting. Yet, but that's cool. The, the library has been mapped so we can see that memory. Now we need to go use the gadget tool. Now on this virtual machine, I only have a not so great ROP generator, but it works. The syntax is wonky, because that's the word it makes me think of, but we'll get it working. So I'm in the folder rope me. That stands for return oriented programming exploitation made easy. I think it was from Long Lee from VN security back in the day. So there's a tool called Ropshell, and Ropshell says simple interactive 
wrap shell. So we can generate, we can load, we can search. The first thing we need to do is generate the wrap gadgets from that libply.lete library. So I've actually dropped out of here and we do an LS. I already copied that over. So I took that, if we, if we grab this library here and we say, locate it. So I got it from here, lib, libply. So that's where it comes from. So what we need to do is then generate the gadgets from that. So we're gonna go back into our ROP shell and now we'll say generate, paste that in. It's thinking about it. I don't know why it's taking so long. There we go. 817 gadgets were generated. Now we need to load those gadgets. So load that dot GGT, because it said that's what it called it right there. So we've got 817 gadgets loaded. Now here's the annoying part. The search command is kind of weird. It's a weird syntax. I'll I think I remember how to use it, but we'll we'll get through it. The very first thing we need to find is an XOR EAX EAX. So I'm going to say search XOR EAX. That didn't work. So let's do comma. Didn't work. What if I do it with that? There we go. So search XOR EAX comma question mark. We found now any result that it shows, it means there's a return instruction after it. It doesn't show it to you, but if it's showing you a gadget, assume that there's a ret afterward. But Let's validate it anyway. So I'm going to grab this 3F14. We're going to go over here. 3F14. 3F14. And I'm going to look at two instructions starting at that address. And there we validated it. XOR EAX EAX followed by a return. That is why I set the breakpoint after the library is mapped so that we can go validate that what the ROP tool is telling us is actually true. We need to start building our script now. I want to get a nice template set up so we can start doing this. So I'm going to create something called, uh, I don't know, ROP exploit.py. All right, now we're inside and we need to start this up. Let's um, import, I can't spell today, struct. And then we're going to create a file. So we need to create a file when we execute this script. And we'll just call it ROP exploit. And now we need to create our, um, actually, let's do the bottom first here. So let's do a payload equals A times 68 bytes. Remember, it was 68 bytes to get to the return pointer. So uh, super simple. I'm going to say A times 68 plus ROP. That'll be the variable we create that has our ROP gadget string. Um, at the very end of our, ROP gadget. So let's put the first one in. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say ROP variable equals struct dot pack. And then we'll do a L with a little Indian, right? 0x. Now this is a 030a. And then what was that address? 3f14. 3f14. So that is the very first gadget the very first thing we want to do is overwrite the return pointer with the gadget that does the xor eax eax simple now at the very end the very last thing that we need to do if you remember is put the string in that we want to have executed by exec ve so let me explain this one real quick if i go over oh man I've got too much going on let me just quit this debugging session real quick so Inside here, there is a little program called scode1.c. And in my 660 course at SANS, we look at creating Linux shell code. And I'll show this to you real quick. This is a little tool that once we create our shell code, we put our shell code right here. And this little pointer play magic down there at the bottom actually at runtime converts S code into an actual function that gets called and it executes what's, whatever's there. So in other words, it's a shell code testing tool like SH test, if you've ever used that. That shell code that you see highlighted is nothing more than shell code to pop a shell. 
So I'm going to drop out here and we're just going to run it. So if I say S code one dot C, it should pop a shell or not C, but we got a shell, but we're not root, right? We, the way that I've made this is I want my command that exec BE executes to actually run that little program so that if it's running under the context of a set UID root binary, we'll pop a root shell, right? And then we won't have a dollar sign. We'll have a, a pound sign. So that's our goal is to have exec VE execute that string. So what I need to do is at the my, my ending variable here, the end of ROP needs to be that. It needs to be the name of that program, S code one, followed by a, a null byte at the end of it. So let me think about that. We need to be dot slash SC0DE1 with a null byte on the end. I don't remember all that off the top of my head. So let me look at Manaski. So I'm going to need a dot slash. Let's see here. So a dot is 2E. So we need DE, 2E, 2F, 7, 3, because that's going to be S. Code it's going to be six three. I can do all those in my head. So S code one one is three one, in hex ASCII. So I've got it now. So the thing I didn't know was going to be dot slash two e two f. Cool. Let's get out of here. Two e two f. So let's do rop plus equals. And here we're going to say two e two f. That's my dot slash. And then seven three is S. And then C is seven three. Oh no, shoot, I got that wrong. It's seven three six three. I mean seven three six three is a lowercase c because six one is a lowercase a. Sorry, I'm talking this out loud because I I'll get lost. Six three f is going to be o. Okay, f. So six f is going to be o. Six four is d. 6.5 is E, and then 1 is 3.1, followed by a null byte. So that is going to be my full string. That's what I want to have executed. So that's why that's at the end. Um, I need to set up some other stuff, though. If we go back to the number of ROP gadgets, I need the XOR EAX EAX. Remember that? Zero out the accumulator register. The next gadget I need is a is a pop pop ret. Where we have to pop the address of where we want to write the null D word minus 24 into ECX. Then we've got to pop into, what is it? Is it EDX? We got to pop the double word of 0B, 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 0B. So I'm counting the number of gadgets I need and then the arguments that I actually need. So let me start building this out. Rob, we don't have the addresses yet, but I'm just going to put placeholders in here. So struct.pack. I'm actually going to copy this part so I don't have to type it every single time. It helps if I put the plus sign in there. And then L0x. All right. I'm going to copy this part so I don't have to type it over and over again. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is pop. We need to we need to get the next gadget, which is the pop pop ret. We don't have that yet, so I'm gonna close this out and I'll put a comment in here. Pop pop ret gadget. Up here is the XOR eax eax. Did I spell struct? No, it's stir cut. You didn't you never heard of that uh, function? I was kidding. Thanks for telling me because that would have been bad. I would have had many, many typos. Struct, not stir cut. All right, let me grab that. Okay, so I've got that. The next thing, so now we need to pop, pop, ret. So we got to pop off the address of, what was that one? We need the, no, the first thing we need to do is pop the double word of zero Bs into 
ECX. Then we need to pop in the address of the null minus 24 in D DX. That's right. So let's paste this in. This guy is going to be the double word of 0Bs. Zero 0B, zero 0B, zero 0B, zero 0B. Zero B. Zero B. We'll call this one um, 0B for exec VE syscall. Great. Paste this in. Next thing we need is the address from the stack as to where the null minus so we need the address of where we want the null double word on the stack minus 24 bytes. We don't have that yet because we haven't gotten to the stack part. Okay, so let's do this then. I'm going to put pad because we, we just don't know it yet. And I'll put here, this needs to be the address of null minus 24 or 0x18. All right, next up. Now we'd be returning to the next gadget, which is going to be the gadget for the actual writing, the actual moving of what's in EDX, which is the address of null minus 24 into whatever it's being pointed to. So we, we don't have that yet. That's going to be a gadget we need. Let's just start getting these gadgets now so I don't get lost. So let's go find that first one we need here. We need a pop pop ret gadget. So let's go over to rope me. Do a search. Pop ECX. I think it's percent question mark. There we go. Cool. So pop ECX, pop EDX, and then a ret is on the end of that. We should probably validate 3F19. Three F one nine. So I need to break. Um, just think here. Disassemble main at the very bottom. Break on the address after mapping of the libc. 804. 8831. So I'm really testing the demo gods today. So this is dangerous here, but hopefully we'll get through it. It's a little bit painful. takes a little bit of time, but hopefully it'll go smoothly. So now let's validate that address, which is going to be 3F14. So examine three instructions. 804, 3F14, I think. Nope. It wasn't 804. It was the address of the libc, which now it's slipping my mind. It's 030A. XOR EX EX RET. So that was the first one. This one is F19. So F19. Pop, pop, RET. There we go. So that's the address we need. 3F19. Great, we've got that gadget now. We're good. So what? Remember, this is a gadget's gonna pop, pop, ret. So pop into ECX the zero Bs. So let's do that. Pop ECX, pop EDX. Great. So it pops the zero Bs into ECX, pop into EDX. This one we can't get yet because that's gonna be the stack minus 24 and we're not looking at the stack yet so now let's move to the next gadget then the next gadget we need after we need to actually write so we need to move the double word of nulls onto the stack into the right position so we need to get that argument that's loaded into edx which should be fine so we need to move to EDX, the null double word, right? Let's see if we can find this. Search, move, it's really weird syntax. EDX plus 18. 
Is that going to work? Can't find a default source file. What? Search, move. Does it need spaces? Oh, I'm not in the right thing. Someone was going to tell me, I'm sure. Just watch me burn. It's okay. So we need to do a move. EDX plus 0x18. Close that out. Followed by a question mark. Didn't find it. I think it needs spaces. The syntax is really weird. Oh, there we go. All right. So we've got a move. Let's verify this. Uh, 3F1C. 3F1C. Move. There we go. Move EAX, which is the double word of... Yeah, I did not make a sacrifice. You're right. We've got the double word of A's, and it's going to write it to the address in EDX plus 24 bytes. So that works. 3F1C. Okay, so think about this again. What's going to happen here? That This is the address that will write. I'm sorry if I'm talking out loud too much. I, I just I need to do it for my own sanity or I'll get lost. This is going to do the move EAX, since we're doing AT&T syntax, to that was... Ah. EDX plus one eight, something like that. That's what that gadget is. It's great. Now the next thing we need to do what's next? So next is let's not get lost here. If we are now using the gadget that writes the null double word to edx plus 24 we need to return to the next gadget what was the next gadget does anyone remember off the top of their head let me look you're not gonna be able to see this but i'm gonna look on my uh, diagram real quick because i forget what it is so we need null minus 24 gets written the next thing we need is a or alcl right so the next thing we need is a or alcl that's to get the zero b from CL into AL, which currently has a null double word. So we need to find a or ALCL. Let's do that. Search or ALCL. Perfect. Found one. 3F20. Let's validate. Oh, it's right there below it. Perfect. 3F20. It's got a ret afterwards. So 3F20. Three F two zero. That's going to do the or ALCL. Then the next gadget. Let me look at my diagram real quick that you can't see. Or ALCL. We need to pop EBX return. We need to pop off the stack the address of our argument that's on the stack. So let me um, get that gadget next. Prop plus equals struct dot pack l and then zero x pop ebx return so let's go search whoa we got a lot of them pop ebx well that's crazy we got so many options let me just go validate three ef zero let's go take a check look three ef zero 3 E F 0. And there we got a pop EBX return. So that address will work. 3 0 A 3 E F 0. 3 E F 0. 3 E F 0. That's the gadget for a pop EBX return. All right, we are getting somewhere. Next thing we need is, so we're popping off the stack, the address of the argument on the stack. We don't have that address yet, so I'm going to put a pad there.
We'll get back to that one. This needs to be the address of arg to exec ve. ROP plus equals. What do we need now? Next, we need another gadget. I think this is the pop pop rec gadget that needs to satisfy the requirement for the environmental pointer and the, the arg v, the argument vector. So let's get this going. Struct dot pack l and we need the address of a pop pop ret let me just double check on my diagram pop EBX. yep pop up ret pop ecx pop edx ret we found that earlier so we can just use this exact same one from earlier perfect all right close that out pop pop ret for envp and argv I know it's not great comments, but it's good enough. Better than no comments. So what we need to pop are going to be two stack locations that we do not have yet. So rop plus equals struct.pack l pad. And I'm just going to copy this again so I don't do it twice. All right, paste that in. Now this first one, I think this one needs to be, look at my diagram. This one, the first one's the pointer to argv and the other one's the pointer to envp. So, argv is first. Pointer to ENVP. So remember, argument vector is a pointer to the pointer on the stack where the argument resides. We're going to have to find this out in the debugger. So pointer to pointer. The environmental pointer needs to be the address of the null double word because we need ENVP to point there. And then I think we're at our last one, right? Because our last one is going to be the interrupt. Eight zero. I'm pretty sure. Let's. Um, I'm going to check my diagram here in a second. Let's take a look and find search int zero x eight zero. And there's one right there. So three f two three. Three f two three. There's our int eight zero, so three f two three. Three f two three. That's um I think that's everybody. I now I need to find the stack stuff. Let's finish up the script at the bottom here though, real quick. Our payload a times sixty-eight plus ROP. We've got ROP all sorted there, barring no uh typos. So I'm gonna say payload. So we'll just create a stupid variable x equals open file with write permissions. Does that look right? X dot write our payload. Um, let's print something out. Oh, what do we call it here? Is that going to work? Uh, we'll find out in a moment. Then x.close should be the end there. I think that's good. Um, let's, let's find out if we have a typo in the script first. So that would be Rob. What do we got? No. Uh, we've got an error. Cannot convert argument to integer. Oh, it's just because I put that pad in there. It doesn't like it. That's not really a error. That's just my the what I put in here for pad. Let me think though for a second here. Is that the right number? So we need one, two, three. Oh, I'm. I feel like I'm missing something. I think I'm missing the address after this of the argument needs to be there let me put in 
one more here. Rop plus equals struct dot pack l, and this needs to be this needs to be the address of the argument. I'm pretty sure that's what's needed there. Let me look at my diagram. So point to the string, string argument. Maybe I don't need that there. Sorry, I'm just looking at the diagram. I can't keep swapping between the two screens or else I have to like put my camera off and then close it and then bring the other one up. So I'm just looking at that diagram that I'll pull up again in a little bit here. But let me just read through this real quick to make sure it's correct. We've got gadget number seven. Which one was that? This was... Let me look at my script, F23. And I feel like it's the address pointer to the string. Oh, that's what I think it needs to be. I think I, oh, I need one more double word to be the, the pointer on the stack to the string that's pretty much right next to it. So let me add that in real quick. So we'll put in here, well, I don't need to put anything yet. Let me just make sure this thing works. Pointer to arg. All right, give me a moment here. Um, I know I could do this through VM magic, but I'm actually thinking while I'm doing it, so this time it's giving me is actually helpful. All right, so I feel like something's missing, but let me make sure this, this thing works. All right, so it created it. Okay, cool. You can see on the very bottom there, it says S code one, like it's all supposed to be in order. I just wanted to make sure the script actually works. So that script is good. But we now need to go and get this, the stack addresses for these arguments. So the first one we need to go get is the address of where the null will be on the stack minus 24 bytes or hex 18. So we need to debug after our data goes in before it crashes so we can look at the layout of the stack. So let's, let's set up our debugging session to do this. So currently my breakpoint is just the one that's after the map, the libc. So let's remove that breakpoint. And let's find a new one. So we'll do it after the call to open or the get. So move is after all that. So disassemble move. Overflow, that's our stir copy call. So right here is where I wanna break. That way I'll, all my data will be laid out and we can look at the positioning and put all the addresses in to our script. All right, run. Now our input needs to be what the ROP script actually created. So I do need to change my input to that. Let me check and see what I called it real quick. It is called All right. So we'll look at Rob Sploit here. So run Rob Sploit. Great. So it dumped all of our stuff in there and now we've got the breakpoint right after the data got copied into memory. So now we want to examine the stack. So examine 20WX from the stack pointer. There's our A's. And stuff's getting cut off after that. So you can see the um, four ones. It's getting cut off because I, I changed that variable to be zero. <laughs> and it doesn't like that. So let me go fix my script so that we can actually see the layout the way we want to. 
So what it didn't like before is that I put the um, strings in there. Because I had pad, right? So let me set all that back up again, and then we can change what we need to change. I forget the find replace thing off the top of my head in VI. All right, it's going to yell at me again, I'm sure. Let's try to run it anyway. Yep, yeah, so let's go back in. And let's change this. No, I'm just going to do it this way. I know there's an easier way to do it, but I don't care. I'm going to go, no, nah, that's not going to work either because then it's not going to put anything. I'll comment it out. That's what I'll do. Yes, I'm talking to myself. Don't worry about me. I'll be okay. So let's um, comment each one of these out. And what I'm going to do is to simply put in a little four byte pad. So ROP plus equals AAAA. And let's just grab that each time. Copy that, because we're going to have to do these one at a time, like I said before. So anytime we see the addresses or the, the pads is where I need to do it. So let's go here, comment that line out, paste that in, same thing here. All right, that should be it, right? Do I have, did I miss any? No, it looks good. So let's save this, run it. All right, we created our file. Let's go look in the debugger. And now I'll get the stack. Okay, much better. Now we can see everything. So once we get here, this is going to be our, our return pointer over, right? If we do a BT for backtrace, we can actually see what it is. So see how that lines up? 3F14, 3F14. So that's our XOR EAX EAX. This is going to be then our first pop pop ret. And we're popping zero Bs. And then this is our first one. This is the first one that we need to determine on the stack. Remember what it needs to be. It needs to be the address of the null minus hex 2,4. So the null, let me look at my diagram here. The null is actually right before the string argument to exec VE. So we need the address just before the string to exec VE. The string to exec VE is right here. That's this. So this address here would be the address of the string to exec VE. This address there would be where the nulls need to be written. So I need the address of this location minus hex 24 or hex 18 because that's 24 bytes because that gadget is going to write to plus 24 from the address that we put into EDX. So that's why we need to do that. It's a little bit weird, but that's okay. Let me just check my script one more time because I don't want to screw this up and have to debug it over and over again. So I'm just checking through things. I might need a few bytes of padding down here. I'm going to stick in a few bytes of padding just so I can have something visible to see when we're debugging right at the end there. So plus equals. I'll just put pad, that'll stick out. Actually, I'll put R, 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 that's 5252525252. All right, good, let's run this again. Perfect, let's go back over here. Let's start it over. Great, let's look at the stack. There we go. Put the R, 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 there's the R, 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 R right there. 
cool. Now I've got something to see. Now before that, this is going to be the address of the null. So we need the address of that. 5FFF or 1120 is, is this byte right there. Then this will be 21, 22, 23. So we've got 20, 24, 28, 2C. So 112C is the literal address. I need 112C minus hex 18 or 24 bytes. So let me do that real quick. Print 0x. That was 12C minus 24 bytes. 276. But I want that in hex. I could do it in shell. But let me just drop down to shell and do it. Shell Python minus C print 0x12C minus 0x18. And I want that in hexadecimal. Doesn't like that because I didn't do this. There we go. 114. So 5F FF 114. 5F FF 1114. That is going to be the address of the null position, which I have highlighted, minus 24 bytes. So let's put that in. 5F FF 1114. 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 That will be the address. Let me get rid of this one. And let's validate this. So I'm going to grab that, save it. Run ROP exploit, ROP exploit. Go back over here. Oh, I got an error. Let's fix it. What did I do? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh no, it's not a string. All right, run this. There we go. Let's go into the debugger. Start it over. Go. Okay, so what we've now done, is put at the very top here, this is gonna get popped. So remember, this gadget here, this address I've highlighted, does the pop, pop, ret. It pops the zero Bs into ECX, and then it pops this stack address, which should be where the nulls will be written, minus hex two four. Let me think out loud again, which that needs to be the pad. Oh, you know what I think I messed up here? Remember when I put in the RRRR? This is actually where the null double word will be written, as we'll see in a bit. So I need to actually use this address, minus 24. I use the address above it, so I just need to add four bytes to it, and I should be good. So let's go over here and fix that. Add four bytes to this guy. Perfect. Run this. Try that again. All right. So this address here is the address of the RRRR because that's where the nulls are going to be written. Minus 24. That's the address I've written here. The next one. So we've got the next gadget here, which is the OR ALCL. We've got the next gadget here, which is the pop. I think it's the pop EBX return. No, no, no. The next one is the move. It actually writes the double word of nulls onto the stack. The next word is pop EBX ret. This is the next argument we need to use. We need to pop into EBX the address of the string, if I remember correctly. I'm looking at my diagram. So we need to pop into EBX the address of the argument which is the address of the string, exactly. So this right here is where the string begins. So that'd be 5FFF1134. That's the address I need, 1134. So I'm going to grab this.
next one's here. One, one, three, four. think that's correct. So this should be the address of the argument, 1134, which is right there. 34 is right there at the beginning of the string. The next one that we need is here. This needs to be the pointer to argv. So this one, the pointer to argv needs to be the pointer to the pointer. So a pointer to the pointer to the string. So that means the next one down this one here, I think it is, needs to be the address of the pointer, the address to the string. So pointer to pointer to string. Sorry, working this out in my head, it's kind of uh, weird to do, but we're gonna, we're gonna get through this. Let me see what I need to do left here. I only have three things I need to do. So the first one here needs to be the address of the actual argument. We just did that one, right? That was the one above it, the address of the argument. The next one that we're popping into EBX needs to be the address. No, we did that one. Sorry, I'm going through this here. What do we got? I know I'm making things lovely, but I'm just trying to work through this in my head. All right, let's go back over here and take a quick look. The very first one that we did was the address of the null minus hex 1.8. We solved that one. We're good. I'm working our way down. The next one was the address of the argument to exec VE. Let's validate that. That is the address of the argument. Yes, we did that one. The next one is the pointer to the argument vector, which is a pointer to the string. And then right after that, the environmental pointer. Okay, I've got it. I've got it. We're good. So this one here needs to be the address of the argument, which is going to reside down here. So see on the right where I put the comment pointer to argument, we need to make this the address of the argument that is the string on the stack. We just did that above, didn't we? Yes, so we can just take this address here and plop that in down here. And we are good to go. So now we need this to be the address of this location where the pointer is on the stack. So we got to go back to the debugger. Right here, the address of this is what we need to put in there. So this is 1120242. A to C, 112C. One, one, two, C. All right. Sorry, I saw a comment there. I took a look real quick. All right. Uh, where are we at here? We need. This one, to C. I might be off by one, but we're going to figure this out. This one here, the last argument that we need to fill, needs to be the address of the null. So we need to point to the null byte on the stack, the null double word on the stack. What's that null double word is going to be right here. So that's going to be 1130. I have a feeling something's not going to work. If this works perfectly on the first go, I'm just going to like, you know, go have a beer or something because that would just be insane and way too friendly and that's not going to happen, but we can dream. So 0x, 5f, ff, and that address was 1130. 1130. Beginning there, get rid of this, get rid of this. 
All right. Now, <laughs> I kind of want to walk through this and make sure I, I've got everything correct, but I almost don't want to uh, jinx it here. So let me format that. Oh, it's going to bother me if this formatting is ugly like that. All right. Now, I'm just going to try it. I'm going to see if it just magically works out of the box and we don't have to debug it. If that works and we don't have to debug it, that's a good day, but I'll take it. So let's see here. I'm going to run my Python script. We've created the Ropsploit, the new one, and I'm going to run it with that input. You're not going to work, are you? Cross your fingers. Ha! Oh, it worked first try. Whoa, that was lucky. I was like so off and confusing myself talking out loud that I didn't think there was any chance that that would work, but we got lucky. It worked right off the bat. Um, cool. So let's, I'm going to set a breakpoint so you can actually see this execute one step at a time. And that way it'll be, it'll be more clear since that talking got a little confusing, I'm sure. So let's drop out of here. I'm going to set a breakpoint on the very first gadget, which is the XOR EAX EAX. So let's do that. That's going to be this address here. So we'll set a breakpoint there, which is the return pointer overwrite. All right. Delete, break. Yes, break on that address, which should be the XOR EAX. Double check. It is. Awesome. And then we'll just run it now. Cannot insert breakpoint. Oh, geez, of course. Oh, because it's not mapped yet into memory. That's why. So let me actually delete that breakpoint. And we can't set it until the, the module is loaded. So let's go ahead and say disassemble main. First, we're going to have to break on any address after the mapping of the libc. So let's break here. 804, 804, 883D. Awesome. Run. Now I'm going to put in that breakpoint. Break. And that's the address. Continue. Now it works. Awesome. So now we are inside move, which let's look at our instruction pointer. We are at push EBP. We are not where I wanted to be. Will it continue? No, it just does not like that address for some reason, even though it is there. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'll, I'll break on the ret. That's that's how we can get around this. Delete, break. Yes, we'll break on the return out of the vulnerable function. So disassemble, overflow, right there. That'll work. So let's do uh, break 80485E3. Run. All right, we are there. Let's see where we're at. Examine. We're at the ret. What are we going to return to? BT. We're returning to the address of the XOR EAX. So if I say step instruction, we are we are there. Sweet. All right. That was annoying. Now we're at the XOR EAX. So we know what's going on here. Right now, info reg EAX. You can see it's got that in it. If I step one instruction and we look at the register, it's zeroed out. So we did this so that we have a null double word that we're going to end up writing onto the stack, remember? So we're now going to return to gadget number two. So step one instruction, we're at the next gadget. This is going to pop, pop, return. What are we going to pop out the stack first? So X slash W2WX, ESP. We're popping the double word of zero Bs into ECX. Then we're popping this address into EDX. This is the address of the null minus 24 bytes. So if I say step instruction, info reg ECX has the zero Bs. And then we're popping into EDX the address of the null. So step instruction, info reg EDX, that's the address of the null minus 24. So if we look at that, it should be 5252-5252, because that's where I put the R's, remember? I think. Let's take a look, though. Let's do a uh, X slash WX EDX. Plus 
plus 24. No, yeah, 24. Yeah, there we go. See, it worked. So that shows us that we've, we've got it organized correctly. That address that got popped into EDX is the address of the R's on the stack minus 24 bytes, which is where we're going to write our zeros. So if I go to the next gadget, where are we? We are at, now we're going to write, so inside EAX, you can see here is a double word of nulls. We're going to write that double word of nulls to EDX plus 24. So right now, if we look at EDX plus 24, it's that. Step one instruction. Now it's a double word of nulls. So we got those nulls written to the right spot. Perfect. So next up, if I step one instruction, we are at the or ALCL. So if we look at ALCL, you can see what's going on there. If I step instruction, now look. Now the AL has the 0B instead of the 0. So that's going to be the system call number for exec VE when we do the int 80. So next instruction, we're going to pop EBX. What are we going to pop? We're going to pop this address, which is the address of the string, I think. Let's take a look. Examine as a string EBX. Well, we haven't popped it yet, have we? No, let's pop it first. Step instruction. Now take a look. See that? So that now is a pointer to the string, which is that little program name that we want to have executed as UID 0. So that's where we're getting our root shell. So great. Next, write a return. Step instruction. Next up, it's a pop pop ret again. This is where we're popping the address for the environmental pointer and the argument vector. So the first thing, if we look at what's popped into ECX, it's this address. Well, what's, let's let that happen. Now what's there? That's that. If we look at it as a pointer, though, it's it's going to be a pointer to the string. So that's the uh, pointer to pointer to the string for argument vector. Step instruction. Let's see first, where are we at? Pop EDX. What are we popping into EDX? That address, which should be, I think, the pointer to the null byte. We'll find out. Let's pop it. And now let's look at EDX. Yep, it's a pointer to the null. That's for the environmental pointer to point to the stack position that contains the nulls. So right now we are probably at the ret. So we ret. Where are we now? Int 80. So if you look at the registers, we've got everything we need. We've got the system call number here. We've got the pointer to the argument vector, pointer to the environmental pointer, pointer to the pointer to the string. Like everything's all set up now. So if we continue. Obviously, uh, we got a root shell. It's not a root shell in the debugger, but we see that it works. So that is that is what I wanted to show you. I'm going to drop out of here. Give me one moment. I'm going to bring up that diagram again real quick. So I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to share one more time. This is that thing that I was referencing a bunch of times. There we go. All right, well, there we go. Cool. So that's what I was looking at over and over again when you heard me like kind of validating what was going, what I needed to do. I just kept referencing this diagram because it was super helpful. That's why I put it together. Um, any questions there, though? I know that was a lot. What time is it? Wow, it's an hour and 40 minutes. So sorry for taking so long um, <laughs> if you wanted that to be quick. But sometimes this stuff takes time. And luckily, we didn't have to go debugging it because that would have been really annoying but useful, of course. But any questions, I'm happy to answer it. Um, I'll wait out for a couple minutes. But aside from that, just a reminder, I probably won't be on next Friday, but possibly uh, if I do, I'll probably pre-record something. We'll see. And then um, I've got a couple people lined up. I believe I mentioned that hopefully I'm going to have the guys from BC Security talking about some of the latest stuff with PowerShell Empire that they've been working on and the C Sharp stuff they've been working on. And then um, I'll be giving away a couple tickets, I think, to Hackfest in Hollywood if you can make it out there. And I've got some other guests I'm working with as well. We're going to have some 
I've got Jonathan Ryder coming back on soon. He might be listening and wondering why I'm saying that. Because, Jonathan, you promised that you were going to come back on in August, I think it was, and show us some more cool advanced C2 stuff. So I'll hit you up to talk about that. I've got a couple folks wanting to talk about fuzzing and just other cool things. But I posted a tweet the other day asking kind of what is some of the content that you'd like to see. And I saw some cool results there. One of them was talking about Windows internals. So I'll do a session coming up pretty soon where we'll walk through Windows internals um, a bit. You know, we'll probably take an hour to two hours walking through just kind of how things work. Uh, that'll be a pretty heavy section as well, but that'll be fun too. So other than that, have a great weekend. If you are going to DEF CON and Black Hat, I'm jealous. Have fun, and uh, we'll see you on here next time. Let's see. Uh, wait, why don't you create an exploit development course for beginners? Advanced user reasonable price. Yes. Everything's expensive. I know it's 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 tough. I mean, training is always complicated. I remember the very first course that I took, I paid out of pocket. It was a $3,000 CCNA boot camp for Cisco. I wanted to be a network engineer. And I remember I took a loan out. I'm not saying you should do this, but I remember taking a loan out and then paying that thing back. Luckily, it paid off. But yeah, it's, it's pricey. And that's one of the reasons I'm on here doing this. But SANS gives away a ton of free resources and a lot of opportunities. Um, if you haven't taken a look, one option is you can try and sign up for uh, being a facilitator. And I think it's like one third of the price of the course and you get to take the class. And once you're in that club, a lot of times I just saw one the other day, they posted up saying, hey, last minute need for a, a TA or moderator and you get to take the class for free. So sometimes opportunities like that show up. There's been a lot of uh, investment and such into uh, veterans, uh, helping veterans get training for free and scholarships, as well as uh, there's been some with uh, women in technology and security going on there. Uh, there's a lot of aptitude testing and such going on with various schools, identifying people in high school and college to get them scholarships as well. So there is some cool stuff like that. Um, there are certainly some courses out there from Udemy and others. I don't really know much about them i haven't taken them but they're certainly available there's a lot of the intro stuff too is out there on the the net if you look at what naham sec has done and uh security tube i guess over the years and there was one I, it's not going to top of my head someone very recently and i can't believe i'm not remembering the name turned into a a training program now i think there's a ton of free courses still or a ton of free videos still out there but i think they're monetizing it now but it's still relatively low cost um how far did i get with networking i got my i did a ccna ccmp ccie written and then failed the exam and then got mad um that was back in the two-day exam when you had to do the, the day two troubleshooting stuff which is pretty miserable um yeah, I'll, I'll, I, you know what I'll do? I'll put together a session where I'll, or maybe I'll just post it, a list of resources if you can't go and take a class, especially on the more introductory stuff. I'll try to compile a list of good resources where you can kind of walk it yourself and, and get to a certain point. Obviously, when you're going to classes, you are getting the instructor's perspective on this stuff, the ability to take what's in a PDF document and then actually verbally explain it and patch and fill in all of the gaps and answer questions that you might have and, and actually run into some problems like you saw us do today. Like you run into some problems, you got to troubleshoot it, you got to fix it. Like all that stuff's incredibly valuable and that stuff more, you know, comes from the classes. But again, I'm going to keep doing these streams and having folks on and I'll just keep taking suggestions on stuff that you want to see. I just did a session with David Bomble. Uh, a couple weeks ago. I think he's going to post it next week. And it's on just basic buffer overflow exploitation, some more of the introductory stuff as well. So we'll just keep going and, and keep letting me know what you want to see. And I'll keep trying my best to get it up there. But um, yeah, thanks again. And we will see you next time.